The ancient world was chock full of fascinating facts that are little known today, for example how many know that the ancient Greek philosopher and mathematician Pythagoras was so peeved about friends drinking more than their fair share of wine, that he invented a goblet that punished greedy drinkers by spilling wine on them. Or that the ancient Romans cleaned their mouths with pee? Or that woo pee cushions existed in ancient Rome? Following are 20 things about those and other fascinating but lesser known facts from the ancient world. Ancient fun from an unexpected source Fun is not what comes to mind when most people think of Pythagoras, the ancient Greek philosopher whose Pythagorean theorem has tormented school children for generations untold, to be sure he had some funny beliefs, such as loathing beans because he thought that they contained the souls of the dead, or that people lost a part of their soul whenever they farted. Thing though is that Pythagoras did not think those beliefs were funny, he was dead serious about them, literally dead serious. When fleeing from pursuers out to kill him his flight path ended at a field of beans. Rather than cut through the field and come in contact with the detested beans, he turned around to face his killers, who promptly did him in. However as seen below Pythagoras did have a fun side, some of which was manifested in his invention of a prank cup that spilled wine on drinkers. Detesting Wine Hogs One fun activity that Pythagoras enjoyed was drinking wine, for that matter so did most ancient Greeks. However Pythagoras had a pet peeve when it came to drinking, he did not like wine hogs. Specifically he did not like it when greedy friends filled their cups to the brim, and took more than their fair share of the wine. He decided to do something about that, and invented a special cup that came to be named after him. Superficially, the Pythagorean cup looks like a traditional ancient Greek goblet, Inside however it contains a column sticking up the middle, one can drink from it like from any other goblet provided one does not try to fill it to the maximum. Pythagoras designed the cup so that if an unsuspecting drinking companion became a wine hog and tried to fill it it would instead drain all the wine and spill it out the bottom. Presumably getting wine spilled all over him, and the hassle of figuring out how to remove wine stains, would teach the greedy friend a lesson about the moderation. The Trick Behind an Ancient Drinking Prank the Pythagorean cup uses the basic principle of the siphon, same as that used to drain gas out of a car's tank with a hose, the column inside the cup has a small hole at the bottom. The hole leads to an inverted U-shaped pathway inside the column. The pathway leads up from the hole at the bottom of the cup's interior, to the top of the column, then loops back down to another hole at the base of the cup. When wine is poured into the cup, the column inside fills to the same level as that of the wine in the cup, so long as the cup's wine level does not reach the top of the U, the Pythagorean cup functions like any other cup. However if the wine level tops the column, and thus the U-bend within it, the cup's special effect takes over. Soon as wine tops the U-bend and spills into the part of the column headed towards the hole at the base of the cup, the cup becomes a siphon, and begins to drain. Once the siphon effect begins, it does not stop draining wine until the cup is empty. P as a mouthwash the ancient Roman poet Catullus once directed an insult at a man named Ignatius, whose smile the poet seems to have disliked. It reveals something startling about Romans' day-to-day -day lives. They cleaned their mouths with pee. As the poet put it in his put down. There's nothing more foolish than foolishly smiling. Now you're Spanish in the country of Spain. What each man pisses, he's used to brushing his teeth and red gums with every morning. So the fact that your teeth are so polished just shows you're more full of piss. The insult regarding an abnormal practice was that of Ignatius smiling too much, which was bad because smiles were presumably worthless, the dis was not about the cleaning one's mouth with pee bit, that part was perfectly normal in ancient Rome. Ancient Romans routinely used urine in dental hygiene. Urine's active ingredient is ammonia, which the body secretes in the form of urea, today we use ammonia in many things, from explosives to cleaning products to agricultural fertilizers. Not only will ammonia remove stubborn stains from your bathtub and oven, it will also leave your dishes and glasses twinkling. In the modern era, we usually extract ammonia with chemical process that do not rely on pee. The ancient Romans did not have access to modern science, but they still understood the benefits of ammonia. So they got it from the most readily available source back then, piss. Piss pots were big in ancient Rome. In addition to cleaning their mouths, ancient Romans put pee to a variety of other uses. The laundry trade, for example, relied heavily on stale urine. 
In giant public laundries known as Folonica, dirty clothes were placed in vats, where they were soaked in stale urine. Then workers, usually slaves, would stomp on them until the stains came out. Other industries, such as hide tanning and agriculture, used not only urine, but urine mixed with feces. Urine was so important in ancient Romans' daily lives and their economy, that collecting pee was a big business. As a result public chamber pots, or big vats where anybody could stop and take a piss, were commonplace. Prescribing pee for anus infections In addition to dental hygiene, industrial and commercial uses, the ancient Romans also used pee for medicinal purposes. Pliny the Elder, for example, praised stale urine as being highly effective in treating diaper rashes. He also wrote that fresh urine was good for treating sores, burns, infections of the anus, chaps, and scorpion stings. To modern sensibilities, such remedies might come across as gross and disgusting, however, considering urine's sterile properties, or more precisely the sterile properties of the ammonia contained in urine, such medicinal applications might have actually had something going for them. Big P was big biz in ancient Rome. P collection and resale was a big and thriving business in ancient Rome, and as happens with any thriving business that generates revenue, the pea industry did not escape the attention of the government's tax collectors in that, the ancient world was not much different from the modern one. Ancient Roman tradesmen specializing in collecting pea were granted special licenses for the privilege, and were taxed accordingly. That was when the government did not tax the pissers directly. One of Emperor Vespasian's revenue-raising schemes involved a tax on public urinals, which was widely ridiculed, when his son argued that collecting revenue from bodily excreta was beneath imperial dignity, Vespasian held a coin beneath his nose, and asked whether he could smell any urine. He concluded the lesson by remarking, money does not smell, a phrase that became a Latin proverb. The Ancient Greeks' Favorite Sword the ancient Greek Xiphos sword was in use since the Bronze Age, and was mentioned by Homer, a pointed and double-edged short sword, typically with a two-foot-long leaf-shaped blade. The Xiphos was used for both cutting and thrusting. Designed for single-handed use, it was favored by Greek hoplites, and was carried by them as standard equipment when they marched off to war. The Xiphos leaf shape distributed the blade's weight more towards the tip, that put more mass behind the point of impact in cutting and hacking strokes. Because added mass means added momentum, it allowed the blade to cut more readily. Additionally, the leaf shape gave the blade a curve on both sides, and such curves were useful in push and draw cuts at close quarters. Ancient Spartans kept their swords short to draw their men closer to the enemy. Shvoi were initially made of bronze, that made their leaf shaped blades easy to create because bronze, unlike iron and steel, is cast rather than forged. Thus getting the leaf shape for a bronze sword was simply a matter of pouring molten bronze into a leaf-shaped mold. By the 7th and 6th centuries BC, the ancient world had undergone significant advances in metallurgy, and iron supplanted bronze in making shvoi. Shvoi were usually carried in a baldric and hung under the user's left arm, as ancient Greek warfare revolved around the phalanx, which was a spear-based formation, the xiphos was the hoplite's or phalangite's secondary weapon. It was employed in close combat for situations in which the spear was ineffective or not ideal. The ancient Spartans were noted for their use of the xiphos, and Spartan shvoi blades were particularly short, measuring only a foot in length. As the Spartans liked to tell anybody who asked, the short blades were intended to instill aggression in Spartan warriors, by forcing them to draw that much closer to their enemies. The Fearsome Ancient Celts in the centuries before Julius Caesar's conquest of Gaul and its subsequent pacification and Romanization, region was dominated by Celtic peoples. The ancient Celts controlled not only Gaul, but also most of Europe north of the Po and Danube river valleys. They had a fearsome reputation that terrified many. The Romans in particular saw the barbarian Celts, whom they referred to as Gauls as their greatest national threat. For centuries Roman mothers quieted down their fussy tots by warning them that the Gauls might hear them. The Romans had good reason for alarm. Throughout much of Rome's early history, Celtic Gaulish tribes dominated Italy north of the Po River and along the much of Italy's Adriatic coast. That was not particularly far as the crow flies, or as the barbarian marches. The dangers of that nearness was driven home in 387 BC, when Gaulish tribesmen, led by a chieftain named Brennus, defeated a Roman army, then marched on to capture and sack Rome. It was a feat that no foreigners would repeat for another eight centuries. 
turning ferocity into profit. The ancient world's Celtic warriors were famous for the quality of their weapons, their courage and ferocity in battle, their frightful battle cries, and their terrifying, but naked, headlong charges that intimidating reputation made them highly sought after as mercenaries. Starting in the 4th century BC and especially, after the fragmentation of Alexander the Great's empire into feuding Hellenistic states, Celtic mercenaries became all the rage from Sicily to Asia Minor, in addition to fighting for the various Greek kingdoms, Celts also fought for Carthage, and formed a significant part of Hannibal's army, when he invaded Italy in the Second Punic War, 218-201 BC. The Celtic Mercenaries Celtic mercenaries were also a bulwark of ancient Egypt's Ptolemaic dynasty in the 3rd century BC, and were included in the Egyptian army's order of battle, for example King Ptolemy II Philadelphus hired 4,000 Celtic mercenaries, recruited from the Balkans with help from the Anagonids of Macedon. They played a decisive role in beating back a challenge from a half-brother who made a bid Ptolemy's throne. However, the Celt mercenaries then made a bid of their own to dethrone Ptolemy, and seize Egypt for themselves after crushing their rebellion, Ptolemy dumped them into a small island in a Nile, to die of starvation. Notwithstanding the Ptolemies continued to hire Celts mercenaries, their lack of local roots made them particularly useful in putting down uprisings by native Egyptians. It remained in Ptolemaic service until the end, and the dynasty's final ruler, Cleopatra, employed Celtic mercenaries. The Ancient Romans' Favorite Weapon the Roman legionary's chief weapon, the gladius sword was copied from the ancient Celtiberians of Hispania, the Romans first came in contact with the Celtiberians during the early stages of their conquest of Hispania, beginning in the 3rd century BC, and were impressed by the native sword. The gladius hispaniensis, became the Romans' primary weapon for the next five centuries. The gladius was thus the weapon that gained the Romans their empire, won their greatest victories, pushed their boundaries to their furthest extent, and brought ancient Rome to the zenith of its power. There was various versions of the gladius, but all gladii shared some common characteristics. They were double-edged straight steel swords, with a blade measuring around two feet in length, tapering into a V-shaped tip. The gladius was used mainly as a close-quarter combat thrusting weapon, although it could be used to cut and slash as well. The handle was usually ridged for the user's fingers or knobbed for a solid grip. A significant feature distinguishing the gladius, as well as its descendants into the early and intermediate Middle Ages, was the absence of a crossguard, the sword with which ancient Rome won an empire. The gladius was typically carried in a scabbard affixed, to a belt on the Roman legionary's right hip, in combat the legionary with his torso armored and his head protected by a helmet, carried a long shield. The shield was initially oval, but later became rectangular and curved. It covered most of his body from his shins to his chin. In his right hand, he held his gladius in an underhanded grip, its tip projecting from the right side of his shield at waist level. The legionary strove to stab his gladius into his foe's abdomen or chest, above the upper rim of his shield into the enemy's face or neck, or if the opportunity presented itself, slashing at the opponent's knees or legs, or hamstringing him with a drawing cut. The gladius' relatively short blade was great in close quarters. It allowed the legionary to step inside his enemy's guard and thrust at speed in any direction from which his foe was vulnerable. That would have been awkward with a longer sword, which would have required more space between the parties for optimal thrusting. The first whoopee cushion? Roman Emperor Heliogabalus was declared ruler of the empire, when he was barely 14, unsurprisingly handing that kind of power to a teenager did not turn out well. While not as cruel as some of ancient Rome's more monstrous rulers, he was no gratuitously cruel Caligula or Commodus Heliogabalus did display the occasional mean streak. That streak often showed in his practical jokes, which considering that he was emperor with none above him, always meant punching down, at the milder end of the teenage emperor's pranking was his propensity for seating some of his more pompous dinner guests on the ancient Roman version of whoopee cushions that emitted farting noises when they parked their posterior. The crueler end of the spectrum, as seen below, was putting people in fear of their lives. Imperial level pranking Embarrassing people by seating them on whoopee cushions is a relatively harmless practical joke, redolent of innocent fun, not so Heliogobolus' habit of pranking people by putting them in mortal fear of life and limb. One of his favorite pranks began with the teenaged emperor getting his dinner guests so drunk, 
that they had to crash and sleep it off in the palace. Once the inebriated guests passed out, Heliogobulus had his servants sneak tamed lions, leopards, bears or a mix thereof, into their bedroom. From the morning, the emperor would bust a gut laughing at his hungover guest's reaction to waking up in the midst of a menagerie of man-eating predators. Between that and other behavior his subjects viewed as deviant, Romans heaved a sigh of relief when Heliogobulus was violently overthrown at age 18. He was beheaded his corpse was tossed into a river and his memory was damned by a senatorial edict. The Scary Scythians Ancient Scythia's King Idanthyrsus ruled a nomadic Iranian-speaking tribal confederacy in the 6th century BC, that inhabited the steppe between the Carpathians and central China, his territory lay astride an overland trade network that connected the Greeks, Chinese, Persians, and Indians. Milking that network's resources, the Scythians created the first of the steppe empires that terrified the neighboring settled lands for millennia. Starting in the 7th century BC the Scythians began raiding into the Middle East, their first major disruptive role occurred in 612 BC, when they played a leading part in the destruction of the Assyrian Empire, that forever extinguished a nation that had existed for over a millennium, and had dominated the Middle East for centuries. The region was eventually taken over by the Persians, and in 513 BC Darius I of Persia sought to end Scythian raids on his empire by conquering them. It did not turn out well. An Ancient Mary Chase Across the Steppe after assembling a huge army to settle the Scythians hash once and for all, Persia's king Darius I launched an invasion along the western Black Sea coast, and into today's southern Ukraine and Russia, it was one of the ancient world's greatest attempts to subdue troublesome steppe nomads. It failed when the Scythians adopted the simple expedient of retreating into the vastness of the steppe, taking their families and herds with them. Avoiding the decisive pitched battle Darius sought, the Scythians King Idanthyrsus ordered his men to adopt scorched earth tactics in the face of the advancing invaders, and had them lay the countryside to waste. The Scythians' men blocked wells and destroyed pastures, while wearing down the Persian king's forces with skirmishes and hit and run attacks. Go weep. Frustrated by the Scythians' tactics, Darius challenged Idanthyrsus to stop fleeing in either fight, or admit his weakness and submit, recognizing the Persians as his lords. The Scythians' response, as recorded by Herodotus, highlights the difficulty in forcing turbulent nomads to fight if they did not want to. As he put it in one of the ancient world's cheekiest responses, This is my way, O Persian. I have never fled in fear from any man and I do not flee from you now, we have neither cities nor cultivated land for which we might be willing to fight with you, fearing that they might be taken or ravaged. As for lords, I recognize only my ancestors Zeus and Hestia. As to you calling yourself my lord, I tell thee to go weep. Darius had to give up and turn back, his invasion amounting to little more than an expensive and fruitless demonstration. Scythians were still raiding the Persian Empire centuries later, until its destruction by Alexander the Great, and continued to raid the former Persian lands for centuries beyond that. 